Good evening, everyone. Um, shall we get started then? Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening um, to this um, really interesting talk about um, Samuel Courtauld. My name is Sarah Peverly. Um, I'm the Assistant Curator for Flitch Museums and Aura. Um, and this is part of a, a long running project um, with the Courtauld Institute of Art in London um, and Greenfield Valley Museum um, in Flintshire. Um, and it's been running quite a few, quite a few years now since um, about 2017. Um, but it, it really got going in 2019 um, when we held um, some memory days um, in Hollywell um, Library and Flint Library to record um, people's memories um, of working at the Cortal factories in Flintshire. Um, and it's this project really that's really highlighted um, that history um, of um, the Courtauld um, in Flintshire. Um, we worked really closely with some volunteers um, to do that um, and with Lorna Kernahan, who was the assistant, uh, who was the um, activities and volunteer coordinator at Greenfield Valley. Um, and we had a really great team of volunteers um, who helped record those memories. Um, and it was from those oral histories that we created an exhibition um, that's running at the moment at Greenfield Valley called Voices of Courtholds. Um, it ran at Flint Library as well, and it's currently on at uh, Greenfield Valley. And this project has been such a great opportunity um, to work with um, uh, the Courtold. Um, and it's involved uh, education workshops as well. Um, and you know, we're, we're just very grateful to the Courtauld. So I'm going to hand over to um, Catherine Dunleavy, who is the National Programme Coordinator. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just going to quickly um, share my screen. So bear with me a second. Um, so as Sarah said, I'm the coordinator for the National Programme. And that means I'm lucky enough to work with our partners um, all over the country, like Greenfield Valley um, and I just thought I'd start by including this slide to show some of the different places um, that we do work in and to give you an idea of how spread across the country um, the programme is and obviously this isn't even exhaustive this isn't everywhere that there was a Courtauld factory or a, a Courtauld link. I've also included our web page there so um, if you are interested in finding out about some of our other projects elsewhere please do take a look. Um, I've also just very quickly included a couple of slides of um, some of the work that's happened with the volunteer projects um, at Greenfield Valley and around Flintshire as well. So um, please do check out their fantastic exhibition um, if you get the chance. But the main reason um, I'm taking up a, a little bit of your time is to introduce um, the kind of history of the Courtauld family before we get to Samuel Courtauld, who's um, the main focus of our presentation tonight. And uh, Barney's gonna share his expertise in that area a little bit later on. But before he even became chairman, um, the Courtauld name and the Courtauld industry and businesses were quite influential. So the Courtauld family actually first came to Britain in the 1680s as refugees fleeing religious persecution in France, and they joined an expanding uh, French community in London. Initially, they were involved in the wine trade, but they soon became goldsmiths and supplied fashionable, high quality silver to households, especially tapping into the market for the latest trends around domestic tea and coffee drinking. And you can see a rather ornate uh, tea kettle in one of the images here. And quite importantly this time, um, Samuel Courtauld, not the one we're focusing on later, unfortunately they do tend to repeat the same names quite a lot in the family, but an earlier Samuel Courtauld in 1749 married the daughter of a silk weaver, um, and although they remained goldsmiths for some time, and she actually ran the business for a number of years on her own after his death, you can see one of the pieces uh, made while she was in charge on the screen as well, um, but this family connection that she had to silk and um, into textiles meant that she apprenticed her youngest son, George, to be a silk throaster. And that's someone who changes raw silk into usable silk thread. So the family moved into the silk industry at quite an important 
an exciting time. Water powered machinery was increasing production and profits. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out that George Cortall wasn't the best businessman. Um, apparently, he was quite argumentative and didn't form partnerships particularly well. But he did a couple of important things. He moved the business to Essex, um, which is where the mills were booming. And um, a lot of the Cortall family stayed there and are still based there today. But he also saw the potential for specialising in silk crepe, um, which is a textured black silk mainly used for mourning wear after somebody has passed away. His son, uh, another Samuel, um, another Samuel Cortall, was a little bit more business savvy, um, setting himself up as a silk roaster in 1816 and developing the Cortall Textile Company as we're sort of more familiar with it now. He invested in steam power and the latest looms, and by the 1850s, the company, uh, which was trading as Samuel Courtauld & Co., um, only made this very specific black crepe, which had a very steady and profitable market, thanks to the long periods Victorian women were expected to spend in mourning, but also the fact that while they were doing that, they wanted to still have some sense of being fashionable. And one of the great innovations of the company was to um, release slightly different patterns to this crepe. I'm not sure if you'll quite be able to pick up the different patterns in the samples there, but if you look at this really heavy roller type object, um, that has lines carved into it, which would have been made to crimp the silk and give it different patterns and textures. Um, at this time, the family were also making their mark as philanthropists. They had an interest in social justice and um, some of them became Unitarians. Most of them supported suffrage uh, and they often opposed the government on things like tax and voting reform as well. And we start to see them leaving a legacy in towns where they have their mills around Braintree, Halstead, Bopping in Essex. Um, they were building workers' cottages. Uh, libraries, schools, and even had a nursery to look after the children of working mothers. So you can see a few of those uh, buildings in this slide. There's a lecture hall for educating the workers after hours. There's social um, sort of spaces and cottages as well. And I think this interest in looking after the well-being of the workers is something we see in the company right through to the 20th century. And um, if you've already seen some of the uh, work happening uh, at Greenfield with the memories of court old workers and um, uh, something that they mention quite a lot is the social side and the, the well-being side as well. Inevitably though um, this desire for morning crepe did change uh, and started to wane and not long after Samuel Courtauld died in 1881 the board appointed a director from outside of the family uh, Henry Greenwood Tetley and he was a great modernizer and reformer and he started to look at how they could diversify what they were making. And in 1904, he really changed the company's history by purchasing the patent for the viscose process to make artificial silk or rayon, as it's more commonly called. And that meant Courtauld was the only company that was allowed to produce it in the UK. So it took a few years to get the process right. Um, it's quite a chemical process. And obviously, they were used to making fabrics. Uh, you have to take wood pulp, treat it with caustic soda and other chemicals to turn it into fibers, which you can then spin into thread. You could make it into various things, but because the Courtauld already had so much expertise in textiles, um, they were able to make this a really successful product, uh, particularly for women's clothing, although they did also make uh, men's clothing too. And um, uh, interestingly, tire cord was the other main output for rayon at the time. You can just see a few of the advertisements, um, mainly from the 20s and 30s, uh, showing the kind of importance of rayon and how they're trying to promote it as this great new fabric. In 1905, they set up the first specialist rayon factory in the UK that was based in Coventry, and it had this research arm to make the products better. And they followed that up by uh, getting the rights to produce rayon in the USA as well, which was obviously really profitable. When Tetley passed away in 1921, the chair chairmanship of the company passed to Samuel Courtauld. Um, the Courtauld Gallery related one that we'll be focusing on for the rest of the evening. So um, we finally got down to the right Samuel. Um, he'd worked his way up managing uh, mills and training in the UK and abroad, uh, but he didn't kind of introduce a huge amount of new stuff to the company. He mainly oversaw a massive expansion and fought off international competitors. And that included the opening of the factories in Flintshire um, that many of you will be aware of. 
Uh, by 1928, Courtauld's uh, company had factories across the UK, employing around 20,000 people, and more factories in the USA, employing about the same number. They also had other factories in various places and investments across the globe, so they were well on their way to becoming the world's biggest textile manufacturer, uh, which they did uh, later in the 20th century. And it was these huge profits um, that enabled Samuel Courtauld to purchase the amazing art collection we're going to hear a little bit more about and to also invest in his philanthropic interests. Um, and I've just included a few images here from um, the Flincher factories to give you an idea of how big and industrial these production processes were. Um, there were some issues while Samuel Courtauld was chairman. Um, there were things like strikes in the 1930s, but like his ancestors, he did believe in social reform and better relationships with workers. And so things were much improved when he brought in paid holidays for the first time, allowed unions to work in the factories um, and focused on education and opportunity. The Second World War also brought them challenges, um, not least the forced sale of their American arm to fund government war loans. But after his retirement in 1946, and the company was able to build on Samuel Courtauld's successes, diversing into all kinds of new textiles and products and cementing their position as a household name right through until um, the 90s brought demergers and sales. Um, but I'm going to stop there because we could talk forever about the later history of the Courtauld factory. And I want to hand over um, to find out a little bit more about Samuel Courtauld's other interests, but um, I will be uh, joining again later to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Catherine, for, for that. And welcome everybody this evening. It's, uh, although obviously I can't see you, it's very nice to see on the little counter uh, on my screen, how many people are, have joined us this evening. Um, my name's Barnaby Wright, I'm the Deputy Head of the Courtauld Gallery, and I wanted to uh, tell you a bit more about um, the figure of, uh, of Samuel Courtauld, the founder of the Courtauld Institute of Art, um, and the remarkable collection that uh, he formed. Um, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. I hope that's uh, I hope that's visible to you uh, to you all. Here is uh, here is Samuel Courtauld in one of the very few photographs that uh, that survive of uh, of Courtauld. Very surprising in terms of uh, what a major collector he was and what a major figure of industry and indeed public figure he was. Um, there's also very little actually left behind in terms of an archive of correspondence or writings or the sorts of things that you might expect from a figure of his stature. So some of what uh, I will be talking about this evening is sort of pieced together from material here and there, but it's, uh, it, it's not the easiest job to uh, really understand in detail the early, uh, the early Samuel Courtauld. As I'm sure many of you are aware, um, the Courtauld Gallery in London, in central London, in Somerset House, uh, is home to uh, a wide collection of art ranging from the medieval period right up to the 20th century. But at its heart, um, and what it is most famous for, is a really staggering collection of paintings by French uh, 19th century painters associated with the Impressionist movement, um, so figures such as Monet and Renoir and Manet, and also the post-Impressionist group of artists who are centred around figures such as Gauguin, Van Gogh, uh, Seurat, Cezanne and others. And this is the collection that Samuel Courtauld uh, put together and um, bequeathed, well, gave and then bequeathed to set up the Courtauld Institute of Art in 1932. Um, today, uh, this is uh, the view of uh, the Impressionist collection, which has recently been redisplayed in the completely refurbished galleries in Somerset House. So here's one view and here's another. Uh, the collection has um, pride of place in uh, in what's known as the the great room um, 
of Somerset House. And so here you see examples on the left of works by Van Gogh and uh, Seurat, on the right by Monet and Dead Ahead by Cezanne. So this is a collection enjoyed by visitors, uh, both in this country, but, uh, but around the world. And is the, the sort of most important collection of its type in the United Kingdom. But I want to tell you a bit more about how it came to be put together. Um, and that was due to Samuel Courtauld himself, who, um, as you've heard from Catherine, and as I'm sure you're aware, many of you anyway, was um, a sort of captain of industry in the first half of the 20th century, um, having taken up the reins of um, uh, Courtauld Limited, the textile uh, company in 1921, and as Catherine said, oversaw uh, a really major period of expansion uh, in its uh, operations, both in this country and uh, and internationally during that uh, during that period. So Courtauld therefore comes into the family money, as it were, in 1921. Um, and he, uh, as soon as he does so, he immediately starts buying um, what were then called modern French pictures. So starts buying the work of the um, of the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists. Um, he does so uh, alongside his beloved wife, um, Elizabeth Courtauld, who uh, is seen, they're both seen here in later life, but they married in 1901. Um, and uh, she also helped uh, shape the collection with him um, and is an important part of the story, although a much less well-known figure. And it's something we've been trying to address in recent years is to understand more about her and her interests and her role. And this is yeah, maybe one of only two photographs we know of of them, uh, of them together in later life. That year, 1901, was important when they got married because they traveled to Italy that year to look at uh, the sites, but also to look at art. And Courtauld had shown no particular interest in art or collecting uh, before, and he certainly didn't come from a family of collectors. His uh, Huguenot family, uh, Huguenot in origins, were um, yes, were were sort of philanthropists and, and socially minded, but they weren't collectors. But when he went to Italy in 1901, he saw great examples of Renaissance painting and other um, old master. Uh, artwork that he was really bowled over by and he said at that moment uh, British what he called British academic art I think he meant the sort of rather formal official looking art that was seen on the walls of the Royal Academy in Edwardian England that uh, that sort of fell away he said that died for him and the vitality of that great tradition of European painting from the Renaissance onwards really started to speak to him um, so that perhaps was an artistic awakening uh, for him. Um, this all before he took over the running of the, of the Courtauld Textiles firm. It wasn't until a decade or more later that he first started to become aware of and take a strong interest in the sort of art that he would then go on to collect. Um, so he saw pictures including this Manet music in the Tuileries Gardens and the Renoir umbrellas um, as part of a display of work from the Dublin-based collector's um, collection, Hugh Lane, who had died um, in the sinking of the Lusitania uh, in 1915. In 1917, some of his collection went on display and Courtauld was particularly uh, sort of this sparked an interest for Courtauld in this type of work. But actually, it wasn't until just a few years later, uh, in 1922, so just at the moment he'd taken over the running of the Courtauld firm, that he saw this painting by Paul Cezanne, um, one of his Provencal paintings, which had been... Uh, purchased a few years earlier by these two uh, remarkable women known as the Davis sisters, Gwendolyn and Margaret Davis, who uh, were uh, based uh, in Wales and were two of the sort of 
very early collectors, early in, in the UK, collectors of uh, some works by Cezanne and other Impressionists, which are now in the National Museum of Wales. So Courtauld saw this picture, um, which just completely knocked him sideways. And he said he just loved everything about it. It spoke to him on a sort of, yeah, on a sort of emotional level. And he said that day he felt the power and the magic of Suzanne. And he said he had felt it therefore throughout his life since that moment. So this was really his, his major awakening. And what is surprising about that is that, um, Cezanne was not a well-loved artist in the UK in the beginning of the 1920s, nor were most of the Impressionist artists uh, that Courtauld went on to collect. They received, continued to receive quite a hostile and sceptical reception uh, in the UK, and indeed no examples of work by Cezanne or Monet or Renoir were part of the national collections at that time in the early 1920s. So for Courtauld to be moved by this picture really uh, went against the grain of a lot of sort of established uh, art world taste. However, uh, not only did um, he fall in love with the picture, he decided at that point that he would do something about um, the fact that collectors in the UK of Impressionist pictures were few and far between, um, and that he would use some of that wealth that he had uh, started to acquire through running the Courtauld's firm to uh, build a collection of Impressionism and post-Impressionism. And he started doing that in earnest in 1923. Um, and uh, he, these are uh, five of the pictures that he bought that year. Um, he bought his very first Cezanne that year, which is the still life with Plaster Cupid, and went on to acquire really significant um, works by um, other artists associated with those movements from Gauguin, Manet to, to Monet and, and Daumier here. Um, he went on um, in the 19, through the 1920s to acquire Yes, maybe about the same number as this, four or five major pictures a year through the 1920s, which he hung at his house in Portman Square, an 18th century house in Portman Square, which is called Hume House. Uh, so he, it was very important to him that he lived with the pictures that he owned. <clears throat> Above all, the artists that he collected with most passion and in most depth was uh, was Paul Cezanne, um, who um, he uh, really sort of set about trying to trying to acquire a representative group of works by, and he managed to put together a really yeah, astounding group of pictures, which include some of Cezanne's most famous. Uh, subjects such as the card players um, and the mountain in Aix-en-Provence where Cezanne lived and worked, Montaigne Saint-Victoire, um, as well as works on paper and other major, uh, major canvases. So Corto, uh, sorry, Cezanne was really uh, at the heart of, uh, of everything that he, uh, that he did. But it's worth just sort of pausing and, and thinking about that context in which Courtauld was buying and what the immediate sort of story before Courtauld started putting together his collection was. I'd mentioned that Impressionism had a really hostile reception in this country. Um, I mean, just flicking back one slide, when Courtauld was buying these pictures in the, um, in the 1920s, Impressionism was already 50 years old. Those artists such as Monet and Renoir and others had burst onto the scene uh, in Paris in 1874 with a, this remarkable new way of painting the effects of light and with these sort of uh, really, uh, yeah, really uh, radical types of brush stroke, painting outdoors, really turning on uh, on its head the rules of art at the time. Um, Cezanne perhaps going even further, producing um, producing pictures which would later inspire 20th century artists like Picasso and, and Braque and Matisse and others, pushing the possibilities of painting even further. Um, 
but um, in, 19, in the 1920s, as I say, this was all work that was, uh, that was several decades old, yet in the UK there was still real, the art world uh, and art establishment had real trouble coming to terms with this work. Many felt that it was not going to last, that it was a passing fashion, a fad, that Cezanne in particular was a clumsy painter and not worthy of the walls of a great institution. There had been lots of uh, several sort of valiant efforts to introduce Impressionism to this country and to try and uh, um, try and uh, make it part of the public collections uh, in the UK and indeed to um, to make it part of um, part of sort of cultural life, shall we say. It was exhibited quite regularly, Impressionist art, in the late 19th century and early 20th century by um, the Parisian dealer who was called Paul durand who was mainly based in the French capital, but brought selections of the artists he represented over to London quite regularly uh, and had them on the walls of his gallery. So this is a, a view from 1905, when you could have walked into uh, his gallery in London and and bought off its walls Renoir's famous uh, painting La Loge, which would later um, be, become part of Samuel Courtauld's collection. But despite those efforts, really, uh, there were very few collectors who were buying more than one or two pictures in this country, and Impressionist work did not feature as part of the, uh, as part of the national uh, collections or was shown very widely. Then a major sort of event happened uh, in 1910, uh, represented by the two images at the bottom of the slide, when uh, Roger Fry, the curator and critic and artist, um, decided to mount an exhibition called Manet and the Post-Impressionists, uh, which um, introduced really for the first time the work of uh, artists such as Cézanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, to, um, to the UK, and he mounted this exhibition in 1910, which was later referred to as, um, um, as the art quake uh, of that year. Um, and it really did shock the British public. I mean, it was a sensation. People flocked to see it. They'd never seen examples of sort of work by Gauguin and Van Gogh before. And they were really sort of, yeah, it really did a huge amount to make people in the UK realise that something incredibly exciting had been going on in France that many people were, were not aware of. And it also inspired um, uh, sort of avant-garde artists in London at the time to, uh, to sort of in a sense, paint in a more radical and experimental and modern manner. So Roger Fry has a has a big role to play in, in sort of uh, introducing some of this work to uh, this country. He was also a friend uh, of Samuel Courtauld's, and when Courtauld started to buy work in the 1920s, uh, Fry was somebody that he sometimes talked to and got advice from and bounced ideas off uh, as he was forming his collection. Um, as an example, just of uh, a small example of a little bit of the, um, the hostility uh, towards this type of work, this major picture by Paul Gauguin, one of his Tahitian pictures called Nevermore, which uh, Courtauld uh, went on to buy in 1924, was in fact offered at a very uh, reasonable price to uh, what is now the Tate, was then the, the Millbank Gallery, in 1917, and was, uh, was turned down by them at that point. They, to this day, ha don't have a picture by Gauguin as great as, uh, as, great as this. And then just as a, a, another couple of examples, um, in 1918, when the artist Edgar Degas died and his collection of work by both his own work, but also that of his contemporaries, he had a major collection of work by everyone from Manet to Cezanne, came on sale in Paris, uh, came up for sale as an estate sale in Paris. The economist and friend of, uh, friend of Fry's and, and of Courtauld, Jay, uh, John Maynard Keynes encouraged the then director of the National Gallery to accompany him to uh, 
to Paris to the sale to buy work. And the National Gallery director really passed on uh, almost everything that was, uh, that was available and suitable. Uh, and it fell to uh, Keynes himself of relatively modest means to buy this little Cezanne still life of apples, which he took back to, uh, to London with him um, and is now in the Fitzwilliam Museum. The picture that had first so moved Courtauld, the Cezanne landscape at the bottom here, um, belonging to the Davis sisters, was finally accepted to be shown on the walls of a national collection in the form of the Millbank Galleries, Tate, where Tate Britain is now, um, in not until 1922. Uh, so just at the outset that, of Courtauld's collecting, um, finally a Cezanne on loan was uh, was shown on the walls of the national uh, of a national gallery, but Courtauld really um, needs to be seen in the twenties not just as amassing a private collection, which he certainly uh, was doing, uh, but at the same time uh, collecting um, a second uh, set of works. Um, and so as he set out to uh, put together his own private collection, um, he decided to endow the nation with uh, what was then a very considerable sum of money because these pictures were not going cheap then many other collectors internationally were buying them collectors in um in the states and in europe and earlier pre-revolution in russia uh, had collected work by these artists so prices were, were high for the times but courtauld endowed the nation with a sizable sum of money in 1923 uh, precisely and under the condition that it was used to buy impressionist and post-impressionist pictures for the public uh, for public benefit he very wisely administered the fund and chaired the group uh, that bought pictures and in what was just a remarkable spending spree let's say between 23 and about 25 they bought some of the pictures which are now the sort of foundation of the impressionist collection at the national gallery in london so that includes van gogh's famous sunflowers which is you know the picture that many people go to the national gallery to seek out and see one of the most famous van goghs in the world um, as well as the monumental picture by Seurat, bathers at uh, Anier, uh, which you see below there. So Courtauld, at the very outset of his collecting, was entirely philanthropically minded and really set out to change public taste, in a sense, for this type of picture that he believed in so, uh, so passionately. And he uh, was able to go on to buy, yeah, some of the really great uh, pictures, 19th century pictures, uh, pictures that you couldn't really write a history of, uh, of, of 19th century painting without including, partly under the guidance and help of this man, very little known uh, dealer called Percy Moore Turner, who um, helped Courtauld with some of the purchases. Although Courtauld was very much, it's important to stress, uh, of the belief that the, that a picture had to speak to him on a to him and his wife on an emotional level on a sort of really sort of personal level he wasn't interested in although he bought great masterpieces and his taste was uh, has sort of been borne out by by history but he actually wasn't about he, he wasn't uh, trying to just buy trophy pictures in inverted commas he wanted to buy pictures that really spoke to him and when he bought Manet's great last last great picture the bar at the Folie Bergère painted just uh, the year before Manet died um, when he bought that in 1926 uh, he and his wife uh, Elizabeth sat with it it was brought over to London um, from I think Switzerland for him to have on approval and to uh, to look at and he and his wife sat with it in in their home for um, for a good while um, and decided that the picture was going to stay in London and that they would buy it and that um, that sort of belief really um, in the importance of pictures speaking to he and his wife uh, on an emotional level was really was really important for his wider vision of art because Courtauld 
never saw himself as a great art expert, a connoisseur or an art historian of any kind. He saw himself as somebody that was well attuned to art, but he felt that if a picture could speak to him personally, then there was no reason why it couldn't speak to uh, anybody uh, in the country, anybody working in his factories, anybody in the street outside his offices. And he saw Impressionism as having this sort of, he would have seen it as a sort of democratic character, that it didn't require a huge amount of uh, classical education or biblical knowledge or any of the things that one might feel one needed to understand earlier art that dealt with those themes. It was a, an art that could really be grasped sort of viscerally um, and could speak for on a sort of very personal level. And, th and that was very important for his idea of uh, art for all, as he put it, and, and putting art in the service of, uh, of society. And that sense of philanthropy and making art accessible and available uh, was also something that we discover um, was central to Elizabeth Courtauld, who, sorry, I pause because she's always known as Lil. He always called her Lil, and in the family she's called Lil. Lil Courtauld, um, his wife, who was definitely part of the, uh, of the collecting of, of the paintings, but she herself also had a great passion for uh, music. Um, and one of the things that she um, funded and worked tirelessly on, particularly in the, in the 1930s, was trying to uh, make classical music uh, played by great orchestras from uh, around Europe um accessible to as many people as possible and so she put on she she initiated um a series of concerts that had concession really significant concessionary tickets available to allow music to be uh, shared more uh, more widely so that was uh, sort of happening at the same time as Courtauld was uh, buying his um, buying his pictures uh, buying that they were buying the pictures um, and he went on uh, throughout the 20s and into the 30s um, and I just show here a few more highlights from the collection which include uh, uh, Van Gogh's self-portrait with bandaged ear, um, which is currently the subject of a, of a major exhibition uh, at the Courtauld here at Somerset House. This was the um, home, the, uh, sorry, it's called Home House, it's actually pronounced Hume House, um, but this was Samuel and Elizabeth Courtauld's home, Hume House in Portman Square, just, just behind Oxford Street in London, great sort of 18th century townhouse. Um, and this is where they uh, hung the collection in this uh, really, yeah, really ornate and, and remarkable 18th century interior. And you see uh, certain pictures picked out here on the walls, ranging from the card players to, um, to, the, to one of the Tahitian pictures by Gauguin. Um, and then in other views of these rooms, you see the, the Laloge painting in the, in the drawing room. And uh, let me see Degas, uh, the Degas pastel woman uh, after, called after the bath in his, uh, in his study. So they lived here um, throughout the 1920s in, in Hume House in these great surroundings. Um, very sort of sadly, tragically for for everybody, Elizabeth Courtauld died at the end of the decade and Courtauld was really yeah, quite bereft. And it was at that time that his ideas for uh, founding uh, an institution dedicated to the study of art history uh, was, was really uh, crystallizing for him. So at the, around the time that Elizabeth Courtauld died, Courtauld was working with uh, two other men, Lord Lee of Fareham and Sir Robert Witt, on an idea to set up an institution which would be the first institution dedicated to the study of art history as a undergraduate and postgraduate subject. So before uh, that point, you couldn't go and study art history at university, it didn't exist as a subject. So uh, they banded together in the late 20s and early 30s to come up with the idea of uh, founding an institute. Um, I, I say that it coincided with Elizabeth Courtauld's death because I think Courtauld uh, felt that 
the house, Hume House, was really no longer a home for him after she had passed away and he didn't want to live there anymore without her. And that, uh, in part, prompted his decision as they were these three men were, were working out the ideas for what would become the Courtauld Institute of Art that prompted Courtauld's decision to, uh, in fact, give the lease on Hume House on his um, uh, on his London residence uh, up to give it to set up the Courtauld Institute of Art uh, on the in those grand premises in 1932. And at that same time, he gave uh, the lion's share of his Impressionist collection uh, to uh, as the founding collection of the Courtauld Institute of Art, with the ambition that students would study the collection, uh, as well as pursuing their uh, other other sort of art historical interests as part of a university, uh, university institution dedicated to art history, but also crucial that it would be available to the public. And so at that point in 32, when the Courtauld was founded, uh, you could, uh, by appointment and on certain days, uh, go and see the collection. So really this great private collection became public after only 10 years of Courtauld starting to, uh, starting to buy it um, alongside the collection that he directly bought for the nation. And these are two uh, nice sort of before and after slides. So uh, the, the, I think this is maybe the maybe this is the ballroom, I think it is, uh, in Courtauld's time, just, be, just as he was leaving the house in 1932. And then uh, the students move in, makeshift, makeshift folding chairs are brought in, the room is turned into a lecture theatre with a sort of pull down screen. And on the walls, you won't You'll have to take my word for it, but on the left is Manet's Déjeuner Célèbre, and on the right, uh, Gauguin's Great Tahitian Picture. So those lucky first students sort of shared their lecture room with uh, with these great pictures. Um, and then, uh, yeah, a further picture slightly later and in colour showing uh, the Courtauld Institute in its early days in Courtauld's former drawing room. Um, and finally, uh, the I guess we'd call it the academic office today, the, the sort of administration room of the Courtauld University, the Courtauld Institute, uh, with uh, various members of staff typing away, uh, but hanging behind them the first Cezanne court I'd ever bought, the still life with plaster cupid and the, the Degas uh, pastel and so forth. So remarkable sort of early days from the 30s through to the 50s at, uh, at, at Hume House when the collection was there. Courtauld in 32 moved out of Hume House and sort of round the corner to a house in North Audley Street and he kept with him a selection of, of works uh, that he wanted to be surrounded by and this is a rare photograph um, I guess from the let me see, I guess from the 40s of his house in, in North Audley Street, no, maybe slightly later, um, showing some of the works that he surrounded himself with. But actually when he then, uh, when he died uh, in 48, he uh, bequeathed uh, most of the rest of these works uh, to the Courtauld. Sorry, in 47, he bequeathed most of the rest of the works to the Courtauld, which came to the Courtauld in, in 48. Um, Sorry, just before I go on to that. So the collection that he founded, yes, as I say, continues to be at the heart of uh, of, of the Courtauld, enjoyed by um, enjoyed by visitors from around the world as well as in this uh, as well as in this country, and also crucially uh, studied and researched along with the rest of uh, the collection, which has grown over the years since he and others founded the Courtauld in uh, 1932 with that amazing. Uh, gift of Impressionist pictures. Since then and over the decades, uh, other collectors have been inspired to give works to the Courtauld, um, inspired really by the example of Samuel Courtauld. Um, and so the collection has grown during the history uh, of the institution um, and now uh, can sort of span a chronological range from the medieval period right into the modern period of the, of the 20th century. So it's not a collection that has ever grown through acquisitions or through some big budget that the Courtauld might, 
yeah in, in an ideal world have had uh, but no it's grown through major collectors giving whole collections or individual works to continue the legacy that uh, that Courtauld really established when he founded the institution um, and just to give you a sort of flavor of yeah how seriously uh, he took that sort of mission for art uh, and how important he saw it as its role in society uh, just sort of to end with a with a quote from from Courtauld written towards the end of his life and he says that uh, he sees art as the most uniformly civilizing influence which man has ever known it's universal and eternal it ties race to race and epoch to epoch overleaps divisions and unites men in one all-embracing disinterested pursuit so his his ideals and his belief in the, the sort of civilizing power of art and the, the importance of art uh, was, was really, uh, yeah, really very deeply felt. And although the language that he uses here feels of its time, that idea that art should be shared as widely as possible and made as accessible as possible and understood as, as deeply as possible is something that's very much at the heart of the court of today. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing and return to my fellow panelists, I hope. Well, thank you, Barnaby. That was that was absolutely fascinating. I love hearing about Samuel Courtauld and um, you're such a powerful message there at the end. Um, certainly during um, this project, I've really grown to love all those paintings that you've shown. Um, and you know my appreciation for the Impressionists has, has really grown, uh, and for Simon Courtauld himself, of course. Um, so, um, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, we've had a question already um, from Mac. Um, if, if you're happy to answer some questions, um, uh, were these paintings still expensive to buy in the 1920s? Well. Um, yes, Mac. I saw your uh, I saw your question pop up and thought I'd seamlessly woven it into something that I was saying. But it's good to have the chance to just expand that slightly. Yeah, they absolutely were um, because uh, you know major collectors in Europe and elsewhere had already started to buy the pictures, and they were collected in much more uh, depth uh, elsewhere. So when Courtauld was buying in the twenties. The, these were not sort of bargain basement pictures that he was able to pick up. These were this was sort of going toe to toe with uh, major and very wealthy collectors, um, uh, very wealthy collectors around around Europe and and particularly in America. In America, there was yeah huge wealth and huge efforts to to buy up this sort of European art and American public collections today are the beneficiaries of, of that in in many cases so Courtauld put you know significant amounts of his income into into buying this work and for the nation um, but those prices are nothing compared of course to uh, how those pictures have inflated in value uh, in in more recent decades Um, we have another question from Caroline. While acknowledging the quote from Courtauld was written and said in the language of his time, um, what do you think he meant by disinterested pursuit? I think probably he meant the sort of uh, the, the, the purity of approaching art um, in a sort of scholarly, uh, scholarly way, but also in, in a sort of very open way that wasn't biased by a particular, um, I mean, whether we believe him or not, it's another matter, or whether it's possible is another matter, I should say, but that what that was, was sort of pure in its intention to sort of understand art to its fullest degree um, and to follow this kind of great European, as he would see it, this great sort of European tradition of art, but also more, more widely, he was interested in art more widely. So I think it's that sense that um, that art could unify us all and we the pursuit of art was something that would sort of overcome boundaries and divisions because people were all interested in being moved by and understanding uh, understanding the art that they were looking at. I think that really struck me what you said earlier about um, Samuel Courtauld you know being quite humble really about not saying he, he wasn't an expert in art at all but it was the, the fact that 
it was the emotion that the the painting invoked that you know drew him to it and you know um that started that love of impressionism and the nature of impressionism um for me as well because it's sometimes quite vague what, what, what's it what's happening that you put your own emotions onto it and you're able to do that um and that like you say you didn't you don't need um you know vast historical knowledge or biblical knowledge about you know the subject um you kind of you can can put your own uh, imagination onto it on what's happening i think that's right i mean i think the way that courtauld responded for to suzanne was in on one level was as a sort of nature lover as somebody that loved walking in the mountains or walking in the landscape and was very sort of moved caught old very moved by nature all around him and he saw Suzanne as offering a very powerful expression of you know the landscape that he Suzanne loved in the south of France in in that case and yeah I think it's that sort of thing that you know that made that that he felt made that type of work or should make it accessible to everybody absolutely I, I i had a question i was wondering about um um you said that him and elizabeth um you know had this um shared interest did they choose all the paintings together or did they have slightly different tastes um it's hard to it's hard to know because we just don't have the sort of evidence for uh, for, for the uh, on the detail and texture of exactly how they did it. I mean, it was definitely the case that uh, she was very interested. Had bought uh, bought a few of the pictures were sort of definitely guided by uh, her because her name appears on a couple of the invoices. So she had clearly gone out and bought one of the Renoirs, for example. Um, it was it was. Samuel Courtauld, I think, who was sort of driving the collection, but I think often uh, they would look at things together and, and sort of agree things together and indeed, yeah, lived with those uh, those works together. That's wonderful. Um, we had another couple of questions um, from Susan. Um, are the family of Courtauld still collecting art for the London Gallery or have they stopped? No, it's a good question because although... Um, our institution bears Courtauld's name. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not an institution that was sort of that the family were closely involved with um, beyond uh, Samuel Courtauld's time. So there are family members, and we know them. Uh, we know them well, but they're not involved directly in the running or the collecting of uh, of work for the uh, for the for the gallery. Um, and they are not, uh, uh, you know, that that beyond Samuel Courtauld, the the collecting didn't uh, didn't continue. I uh, so I've seen the chat just that follows immediately on about Eltham Palace, which is an interesting question. Are the Courtaulds of Eltham Palace related to the Courtaulds? Uh, yeah, uh, that that's a good question. It's interesting just in relation to the continuation of collecting. So. Um, Eltham Palace was owned at one point by Samuel Courtauld's brother, Stephen Courtauld. Um, and Stephen Courtauld uh, did collect uh, to some degree, um, collected particularly um, Turner watercolours and, uh, and other works on paper. And some of those Turners have come to, uh, have come to the Courtauld or came to the Courtauld. Um, so yes. I think there's, a, yeah, there's another um, question from Mac in the chat. Um, it was interesting to see the works of art in situ in their home, um, which I, I really like seeing as well, those amazing pictures just in, in their house. Um, is there anything known about how they decided where to hang each painting? I, I'm afraid we don't have any sort of evidence of uh, or insight into the decision on on how to hang the how to hang the rooms I um, and just looking at the hang it's it's hard to see beyond a sort of just broad aesthetic that things sort of work well in the spaces I don't think there was a a particular uh, sort of sequence that he was trying to unfold through the uh, through the hang. So I think they were. It seems to me that they were hung to make sort of the most impact within the uh, within the rooms, uh, rather than them being curated in a sense to tell a particular a particular story. Um. 
I know you've just had um, a huge renovation in the court hall. Um, so were there a lot of challenges with some of the um, some of the paintings um, being moved and moved back? Because some of them are quite large. <laughs> yeah, it was a um, it was quite an undertaking. Uh, the the refurbishment it was sort of underway um, for about three years or so. Um, various challenges. Uh, actually, you know. Um, the one of the most sort of rewarding things about doing the the project and the closure period was was taking the collection to various other venues both in the in the uk and through various sort of loans that we made from the collection as part of the uh, court old national program um but also uh reuniting at one point uh the pictures that we now have which is as uh, I was talking about were formerly Courtauld's private collection, sort of reuniting them or uniting them with the pictures that he bought for the nation at the National Gallery. So we lent a group of the pictures to the National Gallery so uh, so that people could see the sort of totality, in a sense, of, of the collection together. Um, but the biggest challenge, I guess, was, was really just sort of hanging them successfully uh, in that uh, what's known as the great room, which we had had sort of opened up and uh, and totally transformed to really make the most sort of powerful effect of them. Um, but the logistical challenges of getting them in and around, you know, our 18th century building, which was uh, which is not yeah not the most sort of user friendly by modern museum standards, was certainly there. It looks amazing, um, and I'd love to go. I'll have to come down and see it. It's definitely. Um, has anyone got any more questions? Uh, do we know why Flincher was chosen by the Court Alts and Manufacture Rayon? Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll chip in with that one. Um, Initially, um, it wasn't actually Cortals that chose Flintshire. It was a German company who had a rayon um, factory, which they opened um, in the early um, 1900s, and Cortals bought them out. Um, it closed down during the war. Obviously, German manufacturers weren't particularly popular during the First World War, and, and Cortals managed to acquire it. And then um, they grew massively on the site from that one. They ended up having four factories in the area. Um, all kinds of things played into that, you know, it's near the sea, there's lots of great water links, they could build their railways and so on, but a huge driver in where they chose to be was the availability of the workforce, and particularly women who could work in their factories, so um, a huge population of women available to work in North Wales was one of the main reasons for being there. Thank you. Um, we had a comment earlier on from Sue. Um, whose father worked at um, Courtauld's in Greenfield as a lab technician initially, and then became um, technical manager at Greenfield, um, which is really nice. I'm not sure whether I spoke to Sue maybe at one of the um, memory days that we did at, um, at Hollywell. Any more questions? that might be everyone <laughs> um do you want to say anything else Catherine or? Uh, no I just want to wrap up by um well thanking you both um for being part of this evening and to everyone who watched um as well and we've still got lots of stuff happening with the partnership program and um, some new things still to come in uh, in Flintshire some resources for schools and, and different things to release and also um projects across the UK so um yeah do take a look at what we're up to and keep an eye on it and hopefully we'll see everyone at more events in the future Definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barnaby. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Um, and I always sort of look at the counter when I'm giving my talk to hope that the drop off rate isn't high. And I'm glad to say everyone has, has stayed the course. So thank you. And I'm glad and I hope you found it all, all interesting. Thanks for your questions as well. It's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much.